Oh, there it goes. Right, the announcement. Okay, I guess that means the meeting is now uh, coming to order. Here. Okay. Recorded. Good. Huh? All right. Well, we'll call the meeting to order then, since it's being recorded. This is Becky Kilo India Six Tango Kilo Bravo, your president. I'm coming in by telephone only, so I have no idea how many people are on and and who it is. So I'd like to ask our vice president maybe to uh, take over here and. Uh, Let's do a round of introductions. Okay, uh, let's start up in the, uh, you know, from my perspective, up in the uh, upper left corner, uh, start with Gary. Hmm. Gary, K6PDL, and uh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Todd, you, what? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Rich, Richard Adams, K8SQB, uh, club vice president. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, HF uh, digital mode fiend, uh, working a bunch of Chilean stations. There's one, there's a few of them on the air right now commemorating uh, the 500th anniversary of uh, Magellan discovering the Straits of Magellan. Mm -hmm. What odds are there that he would find a strait named after him? Uh, <laughs> but there's also uh, a couple of stations I work that are uh, commemorating 30 mm -hmm. years uh, or what is it? No, no, not 33, uh, 10, 10 33, 33, yep. 10, 10th anniversary of, uh, the rescue of the, uh, tra uh, trapped uh, Chilean miners. So we're working on getting QSLs, uh, out in the mail so that I can get QSLs in return. Okay. Now turn it over to David. Uh, that's David Dean. All right. Uh, I am uh, David Dean, I'm a board member. Uh, I'm managing the, um, the email list uh, on Groups.io. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure what else to say other than that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Chuck. I'm Chuck, A of 6GQ, also doing HF uh, Digital. I was on uh, 30 meters uh, FT8 most of the morning, I heard Vietnam could not work them. So there you go. All right, uh, Alan. Alan, WD6RWU, treasurer. Okay, uh, Chris, uh, DOZ. Oh, hello, I'm uh, Chris, KG6DOZ. Um, just mostly doing work. That's pretty much what I've been doing. Working okay. during the day. Okay. David Kopp. David Kopp, Whiskey Sierra 2, India. Um, enjoying retirement and doing basically nothing. <laughs> nice. Nice to hear you, David. Okay. Uh, John. K, uh, specifically, John uh, Kilo uh, Juliet Kilo Lima. KJ 6 zl <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, well, let's see. Um, in terms of radio stuff, uh, that's kind of a sidelight thing. Like everyone else, I'm working and got a lot of stuff going on, you know, uh, medical stuff, getting over knee surgery and things like that. Uh, okay. Uh, Tom, uh, KG6AO. Well, I think I'm the only Tom tonight. I joined this club in 1982, so I've been around for a long time. Barely survived the CZU fire. It was it was very close. They they used Highway 9 as a fire break, and I'm on the wrong side of Highway 9, so uh, I'm knocking on wood about now. Um, Spend some time on HF. I've got two towers and monoband Yaggies and stuff like that. So I uh, got my ham license 53 years ago. Starting to get the hang of it. That's it from here, KG6AO. Okay, Karen. Hey, I'm Karen, Kilo Mike 6, Sierra Victor. Um, not a lot going on. You were very nicely managing the um, potentially um, act, 
potential activation of all of us going out for the PSPS. Thank you for your work on that, Karen. Just part of a team, uh, John and was doing most of the work, uh, John Gerhardt. So, um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michael and Sadie. Hello, Michael, NJ2X, and? Hello, Sadie, KN6JYE. And uh, let's see, I did manage to work, uh, let's see, what was it? it? was Santa Lucia and got them in the log this week, which was great. Uh, tried Vietnam today, called endlessly on FTA, couldn't get them, uh, still had fun trying. Sadie, did you want to mention uh, scouting? So What's happening? I'm a scout and scout jamboree on the air is happening this weekend. So if you hear any scouts, um, please do answer. Oh, tell us more about that, if you could, please. What frequencies and time, things like that? Well, it, start, it starts this evening, and it goes uh, straight through until Sunday. I don't know that there are any particular uh, scout calling frequencies, to be honest, but it is the largest scouting activity in the world, is Jamboree on the Air. Happens every year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dan. You're trying to find your microphone button there. I can unmute. Yeah, I'm Dan AJ6DF. Um, pretty much doing just mobile HF these days. Cruising around like through the backwoods, but not now because all the fires, but that's what's kind of my plan. So that's about what I'm doing besides work. Okay. Uh, John, AC6SL. Yeah, I picked up a few new countries on FT8 uh, yesterday morning on 17 meters early in the morning. And today I was down at Watsonville Airport. We got a little bit done in the morning, but by the afternoon it was too hot to work down there. And I'm interested in satellite stuff. I've made half a dozen satellite contacts, but I need better antennas. And I've got the antennas, but I don't have a an Azel rotator for him yet. So I'm interested to hear what John has to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom, uh, KG6AO. Oh, uh, you, you, you already, you already called me. You switched positions, you sneak. I did. All right. <laughs> uh, we'll, move, we'll move on to uh, John, uh, N5HPB. Are you there, John? You're muted if you're trying to talk. Press the space key. Press the outer space key. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll uh, move on to uh, Chris J here uh, while John sorts out his muting. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Jong. I'm KN6IHS. I currently only have a handy talkie, but eventually hope to set up something at home. And I've spent a lot of time with uh, CERT lately, Community Emergency Response Team, working uh, with the aftermath of the fire response. It's been busy. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, okay, now we have a John with no call sign. Muted microphone. Yeah, he's mute, muted also here. Oh, that's AI6LY. He says he doesn't have a microphone. He has a microphone. He has to type everything. Okay. All right. I guess he's a, he's a spectator today. He's, he's come to listen to uh, John's... Uh, everybody wave to, to John. Yeah, everybody wave to John. You can probably see us. He just can't talk. Okay, uh, try uh, John N5HPB again. Uh, any activity there? AI6LY said he was waving back. Uh, <laughs> got, let's see, uh, how, how, many, how many John's on here tonight? Uh, four? At least. Yeah, as we like to say, 
plenty of jobs, no waiting. <laughs> okay, well, uh, now, I, now I turn it over to Becky. Well, thank you. I did not hear uh, John Sizzler, KJ6ZL. Is he on with us yet, our guest speaker? Hello, Becky. Uh, yeah, that's me. Hello, Becky. Oh, good. You are there. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Richard, for um, going through and getting everybody introduced. And thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Becky. I'm your club president, and my call sign is Kilo India 6. Tango, Kilo, Bravo. I'm coming in by telephone only. So uh, thank you and good evening. I would like to ask for, um, uh, let's go for some uh, officer reports and I'll, I'll ask for them in the order in which you've checked in here. Our Vice President Richard, K8SQB. Richard, do you have a report as our Vice President? Uh, the only thing I have to report is that I'm sending out uh, QSL cards. Uh, not too much uh, else really going on. Uh huh. And the QSL cards are from the lighthouse event that you. Oh, those you are all. Uh, those are all all gone off in the mail. I haven't uh, received any more requests, but I'm I'm well stocked just in case any more of them do come in. Um, let's see. Uh, I have a few of them sitting right here, and if anybody talked to me on the on VHF or anything. Uh, on the day or the day before, uh, you're entitled to a very spiffy QSL card here uh, for the Lighthouse event. Thank you. That was a nice event, and hopefully next year um, we'll we won't have the fires and COVID, and we can make it a much more inclusive event. But thank you so much for doing all of your work and creating those spiffy QSL cards. Um, let's go next to David N6DTA, our board member. All right. Um, the mailing list that I manage uh, on uh, Groups IO um, is up to 127 uh, people participating. Nice. Um, we uh, just got two new members today, actually, or two new people who joined. Um, and they asked for information on the Zoom. I'm not sure if they managed to get in or not. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that it's working well it's, it's uh, you know doing what it's meant to and uh it's not getting too crazy uh we've had uh 24 posts this month uh last september was 50 august was our bu busiest uh at 106 posts uh-huh yeah the fire made us all busy didn't it well thank you very much for managing that and um organizing it and and i'm hearing now that the yahoo groups, which used to be the forum for our old reflector, is now going to disappear. So thank you so much for getting us up ahead of the, uh, the curve there and managing it so nicely. I'd like to go now to our treasurer, Alan, WB6RWU. Alan, do you have a report? There have been no changes that I know of. I haven't been to the bank uh, recently, so the uh, bank account should be about the same as around 27 hundred dollars and have been down the post office for about a week. Um, maybe I'll go tomorrow or, or Sunday. But I'm going to Los Banos tomorrow and that's in the opposite direction. So I'm not sure Ooh. if I'll go down tomorrow. But anyway, uh, not much has been happening uh, as far as the money going in or money going out. All right. Well, thank you for keeping good track of everything and making sure we're current on things that need to be paid and uh, checking on everything uh, on a regular basis. Um, as your president, I'll just let you know that the new name badges are in. Don, K6GHA, took on that project. And so we have a number of new uh, badges to mail out. And I'm hoping to get those out to you, uh, to those who were entitled to one and who some people purchased one. Get those out to you in the mail this coming week. So you can look forward to a little package if that is you. Um, I also am... Um, trying to think ahead about the Christmas party. We usually have a very nice dinner and all get together, and I've just got a feeling that's not going to be able to happen this year. So I would uh, welcome ideas that people may have for some sort of an alternate gathering that we could still do um, without really getting together in person and having a dinner. And maybe things will change before December, but anyway... Let me know if you have any thoughts. Um, 
Let me ask if there are any questions from anyone regarding any of the reports or if you have any questions otherwise for any of the officers or the group. Okay, well, nothing heard. Um, thanks again for all your reports. Did anybody have any questions? We have uh, Sadie with us here tonight, KM6JYU, that's going to be participating in the the Scout Jamboree Radio, uh, Radio Jamboree. Did anybody have any questions for Sadie? And Sadie, thank you for, for doing that and checking in with, with Michael. Anybody have any questions? I think they fell off. Oh, they fell off. Oh, oh they're, no, they're, no, they're, they're, there. they're there. Okay, good. They're still here. There they are. Okay. Any questions for uh, Sadie regarding the Scout Jamboree? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask if uh, the Scout Jamboree was uh, communication just among Scouts or just anybody at all? Uh, Go ahead, David. It's, it's, it's anybody. It's, uh, it's an opportunity for Scouts to uh, participate in amateur radio, and it happens all over the world, uh, Scouts from everywhere. And they're, they're, you know, you'll hear them on the air, uh, it'll be calling CQ, and looking for people to answer their calls. So, um, yeah. And, and they, may, they may have a license like Sadie. Uh, I think she'd be the exception though. Most scouts would be uh, using, um, you know, having a ham that's being the control operator for them and using that, that ham's call sign. All right. Sadie, do you have a, a frequency you're gonna try, a station you might try? Well, we could be listening for you tomorrow or before then. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm pretty new to the ham world. I just joined in July, so I'm trying to figure out all the frequencies. Okay. Well, well, we've got, uh, we have HF capability and we've also got um, uh, two meters and 440. So, and, and Sadie has a two meter uh, HT. So I, I suppose you could find us possibly on, on a local repeater or uh, also on HF. Mm -hmm. I try Echo Link also. And on Echo Link through K6BJ. And, oh or, yeah, Echo Link. Yep, yeah. so he's got Echo Link too. And there's and I, also um, IRLP. If you wanted to try that, you could go on and find a node for some other place in the world and try going, <laughs> going out that way as well. IRLP Internet Radio Linking Project, and you can go on the internet and find node numbers for all over the world and, and um, connect that way. Cool. I'll be listening for you, Sadie. I would say welcome to the hobby, Sadie, and I hope you have a lot of fun. Yeah. It's That's been true. fun. Um, the rest of my family has ham license, so over the years, I'm like, come on. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, congratulations oh, I, and welcome. Thank you. I have the honor to put on an amateur radio patch on my uniform at the Court of Honor that's coming up soon. From Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Well, yep. if you could send a picture, we'll put it on the K6BJ website. How about that? <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay. Excellent. Who, who should we send a picture to? Uh, you could send it to, um, we could send it to me and then I'll forward it to Ron Baldwin, K6EXT, unless he's on now, is Ron on? Okay, you could send it to me. Um, okay. I can't remember Ron's email right now, but I'll give you my email if you're ready to copy. If you're on QRZ, I'll, I'll just look it up. I am on QRZ. Okay, thank my, you, Becky. My, uh, Email is my ham radio call sign Kilo India Six Tango Kilo Bravo, and it's at yahoo.com. I'll be looking forward to that. We'll, I'll send it over to Ron K6 EXT, okay. our uh, our website manager. Thank you, and yeah, again, congratulations. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, do we have any other people that have joined us, Richard? Yes. Paul, Paul uh, Titangos. You want to ask him to? Yes, if you could unmute uh, and introduce yourself. Is 
Is it going to work? No. Yeah, here we go. Oh, here, Hello, we, here we go. All right. Hi, Paul. Hi. Nice to see all your faces again. It's been such a long time. Yeah. I got, I got to thank Cap for uh, helping me um, find the link to tonight's meeting just in time. So I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Cap, if you're here. If not, um, I'll talk to you later. Well, thank you. I'm glad you made it in, Paul. What's your call sign? N6CRZ. Oh, very good. What a great call sign that is. It is. Oh, <laughs> I'm on fire about that. Oh, it just came up randomly too. Isn't that, a, isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah. It's a fun one. I should use it more though. It'd be even more fun. Well, I'm glad you're able to join us, Paul. And uh, I haven't heard Cap uh, chime in here yet as being on the roster. He may be running the, the net for the N6IJ group, but um, I'm glad you joined us. And are there any other um, people that we haven't heard from yet, Richard? Oh, there's John N5 uh, Hotel Papa Bravo. Uh, ha haven't, haven't heard from him. He doesn't have a mic. Yeah. And then, he, he had put in chat that he doesn't have a mic. Yeah, and then, there, then there's just John with no call sign. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, let's move on. I think we're all anxiously awaiting to hear our presenter, John Sizzler, KJ6ZL, um, who has graciously agreed to uh, give a presentation tonight. He even got the night off work so that he could do this for us. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to John, KJ6ZL. Good evening, John, and thank you. Okay, John. Uh, Good evening, Becky and everyone. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make you host. Uh, it's very important that when you're done, uh, you turn it back over to myself or somebody else. Otherwise, the meeting ends when you leave. And we are still recording. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, very good. We, yeah, we'll put this up on our uh, website, too. Thank you, David, for taking care of that. Go ahead, John. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thank you. Um, I love talking about satellites, and uh, and I really want to see more people doing it. Um, I, every time we do field day, I try to make it into a presentation thing about satellites. I can already see a couple of people are already into satellites. Gary, for instance, is, uh, has got his setup right in the background there. Uh, <laughs> you can see his antennas. And David is already in orbit. Uh, so I think we've got a lot of people already thinking ahead. Um, let's see if I can let's let's see if I can share screen and uh, get things started here. Uh, as a as a moderator or whatever a presenter is is going to be new to me, so not quite sure how to do this just yet. The green green button at the bottom there that we should say share screen. Okay, so. Uh, blank right now. So, is everybody seeing this? Nope. Go to my presentation at the beginning. Okay. Uh, does everybody see working amateur satellites? Yes, indeed. I hope you can see that. Yes. Okay, good. We're on our way. All right. So, the first thing I wanted to do is talk a little bit about history. And I got to say one thing about satellites is that uh, there's huge amount that I could talk about tonight. Uh, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, I'm trying not to do that. I'm going to try to shorten it and make it into what I think most people are interested in. We'll do a little bit of local, uh, a little bit of history of the amateur satellites and uh, a little bit for fun. We'll talk a little bit about satellite law and then jump right into international efforts. Uh, there's a great deal of things going on. Then we're going to explore the MSAT webpage a little bit. I hope you can see my mouse when I do this. Um, and then get on to what I really want to know, which is satellite operation and making your own station. So let's get going. So in the world of history here, um, amateur satellites go back to the 70s and um, I guess <laughs> uh, space at that time was a little more 
open uh, in a sense uh, compared to today. Uh, we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, at the early stages, uh, they were doing 10 meters, which was kind of a high band, and two meters, of course, which was uh, even more important. Uh, then they went to two meters and 440, which is basically an experimental band. It's a little bit like talking about 10 gigahertz or something today. Um, and those satellites uh, that were up were, uh, they ranged in size from maybe about a five gallon bucket to things the size of a garbage can or so. And um, surprisingly, they're still up there. Um, in fact, some of them are even still operational. Now, satellites are getting their power from solar cells and they're spinning to be able to uh, keep their heat under control. And what does that mean? That means that no matter what about solar cells, only one half of the size of these things is ever getting any energy, uh, only the side that's facing towards the sun. So if you can imagine a five gallon bucket with solar cells on it from the 70s, um, that's not a lot of power, but they were very effective. So AO7 looks a little bit like this. It's basically about two feet square, you can see my house, and in orbit, it looks a little bit like this, and it's, you can see that it has a 10-meter antenna on it. So in this particular satellite, it has 2 meters, 440, and 10 meters, and it still actually operates. Fuji Oscar 29 from Japan down here, it's a little bit, um, it's a ball. You can see that it's a ball of sorts. Fuji Oscar 29 was great, great. Absolutely great until about a year ago, and now it has finally had battery issues. Um, so it is in low power mode. Now, there were some others that were also quite exciting. Um, AO 13 was in now, this is when I talk about what you could do in the past, which is a little bit that you really can't do today. Uh, you'll notice it has a rocket motor. One here is actually had a rocket motor on it, and um, you know, an amateur radio rocket motor. And uh, so when this thing was launched, it, it also ignited its rocket and then went off into a very large elliptical orbit, a specific orbit called the Molnia orbit. And um, so what would happen with that is it was synchronized in such a way that when it was doing its largest length of the ellipse, when it was moving the furthest away from the Earth, it was also synchronized to follow the rotation of the Earth. So in other words, it was moving away from the Earth, but the Earth was rotating underneath it, and then it would come back down. So for a great deal of time, it sort of dwelled in the sky at one location, almost like a geosynchronous. And you could operate that satellite for an hour or an hour and a half or more, and then it would turn around and start coming back. Um, and, and that was interesting. I had a lot of fun with that. When it got out that far away, it covered the whole world. So uh, using satellites and things, you could work Europe and things like this. Can't really do that today um, because the satellites are all in low orbit. We don't have anything further out. Um, so moving on to satellite law, uh, we're going to hit a couple of web pages just for fun. Um, but what's going on in today's world is there's enough stuff up there that it's time to start thinking about it and um, clean it up. Because if two things bump into each other in space, nothing is going slow in space. Um, they're going, you know, 25 times the speed of sound and things like this. <laughs> and, and they would hit each other like bullets and things would, would be big trouble. So in today's world, there is now a law, or not really a law, there was, there was a discussion of a rule called the 25-year rule, which would mean that if you put a satellite up, you have to have a plan to make it go away in 25 years. Mm -hmm. And some of the larger satellites, geosynchronous satellites, and big ones that went out there with rocket motors are designed in such a way that they keep a little fuel. And the purpose for that fuel 
is when they reach a point where they have a chance where they think that they need to deorbit the satellite, they will operate that motor, slow the satellite down so that it falls back into the atmosphere. And that's the 25 year rule. You have to be able to keep that in place. You have enough to be able to get rid of it in 25 years. So is everybody really doing that? Well, that's kind of hard to say. Uh, is that law really, uh, uh, let, let's, let's jump out of here for a minute and read some of the web pages, see if I can do this. Let's try. Space law, can anybody read this? I hope you can read that. It, yeah, it's good on, on my screen. Us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can read it. So, uh, so this is uh, this is associated in the world of international space law. Um, one of the things, for example, in the uh, treaty is that they said that um, you would have to deorbit a space object. But then now people are arguing about what is a space object <laughs> in classic form. Um, Uh, this group here, and let's see how I come up with it. All right, so space jump proposal. Um, this is basically a proposal to decrease the 25 year rule and make it come into a lesser rule. And um, there's good reason for that. Let's take a quick look here. This is the right spot, I hope. Maybe not. That's a, uh, okay, let's go here quick and take a look at this. I wonder if you can see that video. Anybody see this? Looks great on my screen. Please say yes. So this is a view of what is being tracked as things that are in orbit around the Earth. And um, these, these are operational satellites as well as everything else. And uh, I'll bet if we could view, if we could blow, it, blow up on that, we would see that there's even more than you can see. Um, so that is, uh, it, that space is getting filled with things. So it, it is becoming a word. So now back to my presentation here. For example, one thought here putting a non-maneuverable CubeSat into a low Earth orbit in a densely populated section is like trying to run a go-kart on the freeway. Uh, that's one thought. You know, in other words, the, the idea of packing small satellites that don't have maneuverability out there into space is maybe not a good idea. But we'll see how that plays out. So, John? Your uh, bandwidth is a little limited. You might try turning your camera on you off while you've got while you're sharing your screen to improve your audio. Thank you. I thought that was my my problem here. Good idea, Gary. Okay. Why can I not? Um, <laughs> because so many things don't like my Zoom meeting. Goodness. Yeah. Oh, goodness, guys. Um, well, it's a good thing we're hams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and not video technicians. This is the best audio that I've heard in years you know you don't get this in field day uh oh i don't I... uh oh yeah what's that zoom thing yeah <sighs> he's trying to join a second zoom meeting at the same time i'm not sure if that means i'm going to leave your meeting so i think that might take you off 
You have a little camera down at the bottom of your screen. I Is think stop you video? screen sharing, it's at the top of your screen in the center. Bingo, got it. Okay, I'm gonna stop my video. And hopefully that means my audio will stay on, okay? Looks, looks good. So let's get yeah, back. better. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good point, guys. Okay, so international efforts. Um, let's move away from satellite law for a minute. So there are AMSATs around the world. AMSAT Deutschland, AMSAT UK, and AMSAT United States. Uh, there's Japan, AMSAT. There are others. Um, but to give you an idea of the things that these groups are doing, for example, AMSAT Deutschland has been involved in putting up a geosynchronous satellite. Now, they also have got the Mars program. How about that? Uh, that's pretty aggressive to actually put a satellite orbiting Mars. And that UK has been re responsible for the, for the FunCube satellites. They're also doing a great deal of ground station support, possibly more than um, any other group. To give you another idea, Philippines has put up a satellite. Saudi has put up a satellite, Saudi Arabia. Argentina has actually worked on satellites. Jordan has got a satellite up. And, and, and China, of course, with CAMSAT, um, has been responsible for the XW satellites, the CAS satellites. Student involvement in China has included uh, creation of satellites that are currently orbiting the moon. So Deutschland, for example, has done a geosynchronous satellite. It's um, up and down link is 2.4 gig and 10 gig. And we can't really deal with it. It's geosynchronous. And here is the picture of its coverage. Uh, so it's directly over uh, Africa. So uh, good for Europe and um, that portion of the world. But, but we don't get it. Uh, the Gold Mars program, <laughs> they haven't got a launch yet. It, it, uh, they were forward thinking in 2002 is when this idea started and then they reinitiated it again in 2012 and now it's done. Uh, what AMSAT UK has been involved in, they are doing ground station support. You can see uh, their whole setup here around the world and everything has been supported. Now let's go back Your again. audio is kind of fading in and out on my phone there, John. Is anybody else having tr trouble hearing John? Yes. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, let's see what I can do about that. Um, well, you're fine now, but uh, just a bit ago, it was, um, you're breaking up a lot. Okay, um, how about now? That's great, thank you. Okay, since I am not doing video, I am actually going to kind of bring a microphone right next to my face. Okay, let's um, leave this set of pages and go to that. Okay, I hope you can see this on the screen. Um, and I'm going to navigate here, so I follow my mouse here as we play the page. This is AMSAT's homepage. What I wanted to show you is right here under satellite information, um, current status. Now, what is going, going on here? By the way, is audio correct during this? Is this better? Yeah, for me it is. Oh. Sounds okay. good here. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is a list of, of amateur satellites, satellites you can work. And what you can do here on this page is if you hear it, you put in a report that you have heard it. Uh, there is repeater active, there's telemetry only, there's no signal, conflicted reports and things, and uh, cr the ISS crew, <laughs> they, they've got purple for themselves. So you look at this, this goes on five days in the past. It, uh, October 17th, tomorrow is already up. 
uh, October 16th today, and you can see that people are signing into the page and saying whether or not they heard. So uh, all these various satellites, no one apparently was able to use AO92 today, um, but all of these have been operational. Everything blue looks like it's working, and a lot of the others are telemetry only. And let's go back to satellite info and go to communication satellites. Now, uh, this is how many things we get to play with um, to give you an idea. So, there are satellites that are flying that are just FM, meaning that what is on the satellite is an FM detector uh, system, just like a repeater. So, uh, so it's a repeater, basically a single frequency FM repeater. If you want to work one of these and you have an HT, you probably have all you need to work one of these uh, with a proper antenna. Um, but not a lot of equipment required to operate any one of these satellites. And if you can imagine a repeater that has a coverage that does anything from California all the way over to, say, Colorado and covers the whole western states at once, then you can imagine that that repeater is pretty busy. So um, getting in, fitting your signal in amongst that may be difficult if you're low power. Now then there's also transponder satellites. Now a transponder sounds complex, but what a transponder is is a very simple thing. It is simply listening to a swath of frequencies and it amplifies that swath of frequencies and then puts that out, transmits it back out on a different frequency. So it's very similar to a repeater, except that it's just listening to a wide band swath of frequencies. It's not just an, not just an FM detector, it's listening to the whole swath. Anything it hears, it just transmits back out. So if that was CW or a sideband signal or a digital signal or an FM signal, anything that it's within its what they call its passband, uh, then it will be retransmitted. So this is all the various satellites that are still operational that can do transponders. Then there are digital satellites. Now the digital satellites are just what you would expect. Um, send up a digital signal. It, some of them are designed to be store and forward where on board it stores that signal and then can retransmit it down. So you could pop one up to it and then 10 minutes later it's over Europe and it could be downlinking it to Europe or something like that. So there's digital satellites. There's also satellites that act like a digipeter that simply just take a signal in and send a signal out. Then there's a few that we've lost. Okay, back to my presentation for a while here. Now, let's get into satellite operation. So of all of those satellites that we just looked at, None of them, <laughs> none of them are larger than a, than a bread box. <laughs> uh, and that's the world of satellites today. Um, the, the idea in today's world is that you can create a CubeSat. Now, why did there, where did that come from and what does that name mean? Well, basically a standard size was developed so that you could, uh, when, when you're making a launch and you've got a rocket and you're launching something, then they put a payload within the rocket. And if it isn't balanced, then what they do is they have a little bit of ballast that they would have to add to properly balance the rocket. And what they have done is allowed ballast to be usable items. And so they've created sort of a standard size and these can be CubeSats. So universities all over the world are, are doing this kind of work and individual groups like AMSAT UK and um, a variety of others all over the world. And AMSAT North America, kind of less than most uh, the others, are, have been building standard CubeSats and being able to get them part of a launch. Now, um, so far, other than Russia, 
<laughs> everything has been a low Earth orbit. Uh, and that seems to be the place that uh, most of the rockets are going. And the satellite itself, being just a cube with some electronics, isn't got to have a, a rocket motor on it. And most of the uh, rockets that you'll get a launch on would not really trust that you put fuel and a volatile device like that as part of your uh, ballast. So they, they would not allow you to, to add a rocket motor to such a thing. So as a low Earth orbit small device, they are in the sky for a short period of time. We'll talk about orbits a little bit later. But if you get the idea that it's not up very high, then it's going to have to go around the Earth very fast to be able to stay up. And so it's um, going quickly, and it really is only available for 20 minutes or so. Now, there are other aspects of operation, other than the fact that they're low and going by fast. There is always the effect of the satellite antennas itself. They are not necessarily perfect. Um, you would try to make a satellite antenna basically transmit omnidirectional the same amount every direction. You would love to be able to make it have gain and point that gain right at the Earth, but I'll talk about why that's a difficulty a little bit later. And then in a transponder satellite or in an FM satellite, um, other users on the satellite itself take power. And there's a, there's a number of effects of that. And then you try to stay on a certain frequency. You want to you want to transmit up at a specific frequency to the satellite, but this satellite is coming at you very fast. So fast that um, your transmission up to it is going to arrive at that satellite up frequency. So you need to actually be transmitting a little bit low as it's coming at you. Then as it starts going away from you, well, then the opposite happens. Um, you have to start transmitting a little bit up frequency so that the satellite would be receiving it where it should be. That's what occurs with Doppler, and that's part of the game. So all of these things come into play. Now, what size are we talking about for these things? Well, you can see here a fellow working on CubeSat. <laughs> that's the size of these satellites. Where is their orbit? Their orbit could be 400 miles up. That means we're going to try to talk to this little tiny guy 400 miles away. Now remember, only one half of this thing's solar cells are ever getting any energy at, the, at one time. So it is optimistic to imagine that they're transmitting as much as five watts. Very likely that they're not even transmitting that much. Wow. Now here is a giant. This is actually a two cube uh, CubeSat. This is FunCube, um, FunCube 3. Uh, this one had, a, had, had this, there's a number of things on this that are experiments, camera and things like this. So here's a few of them actually being shot from the International Space Station. Now look here, this is a satellite deployment device. You, you could mount these standard cubes inside this device. It's basically a spring-loaded thing. There are two of them in a row here, and they get shot out. And here they go. And notice, already, already, just that launch, they're already not in a good orientation. And in view of the International Space Station, they're already simply tumbling into different directions. So um, they're going to have to be stabilized and um, without rocket motors of any kind. How do you stabilize a satellite? Well, very tricky. What they do is they use some of the energy and on the side, they have a basically an electromagnet and they would activate those magnets in a certain pattern so that they can start creating, so that interacting with the Earth's magnetic field, they can start creating a rotation to that satellite in the orientation that they want. So that's what's going on to actually get these satellites into a position that they're interested in um, and to be able to create a uh, what they would believe would be a stable rotation in the right sun orientation, doing the best thing it can for the solar cells, 
and things like this. So these things go on for months, um, working out how you want to control the little device and get it, to, get it where you want. There's a great deal of science going on here. Okay, now, these are all in low Earth orbit. So here is Earth, here's the orbit, and here's the thing, and here's the satellite, of course. This is the way you almost always see a picture of satellites going around the Earth. That's not what they look like. This is really what a low Earth orbit is closer to <laughs> looking like. The Earth is this big in diameter, and here's our little satellite flying around in an orbit like that over the Earth. Now that is actually up, you know, in the proper mileage compared to the Earth's diameter. That's really what it looks like. So the satellite itself, how much can it see? Well, with full horizon capability for that satellite, it's got a view of the Earth of maybe about that much. Okay? So Surprisingly, if we happen to be in here in California, that might be Colorado over there. Maybe if we were here in California, that might be Hawaii over there. Uh, you, you get orbits of all different kinds, uh, even in low orbit. You know, so these are still interesting to play with, even though we would love to have them be up a little higher. Okay, now, you built this little satellite. You did what you can to be able to uh, create an antenna pattern that's going to be even, but they never really are. Um, a little bit like an apple, you can expect that there's going to be some kind of a null. You try your best to make antennas be omnidirectional so that they're even as they fly around, but you get something like this. So then in an orbit like this, you're in great shape. You've got a satellite like this, you've got the gain heading at the Earth, and everything is good, and the satellite's going around the Earth. Yeah, okay, well, you can't really continue to point that thing at the Earth. So by the time it's over here, your gain is no longer aiming at the Earth. You're, you're now going to reach that spot where the uh, small, the, the worst part of the apple is going to be down here, you know. So mm. during an orbit, uh, yes? Did someone say something? Someone have a question? No. I don't think so. Go ahead. Okay, so moving on. So, um, so during satellite operation, you can expect that there may be fade from that satellite. And it's got nothing to do with you. It's not your station failing. It's not anything like that. It's that the satellite itself, the particular shape of its antenna pattern, might not necessarily be doing the best thing for you. That's just the way it is. Okay. So, in satellite operation here, we've got FM, we've got transponders, we've got digital, and um, FM, of course, acts like a repeater, and so you have one channel to work with. Um, it will pick up your signal and transmit an FM um, output. Uh, actually, some of them have even have, have digitized capability where they take in an FM signal and they actually will put out a AM radio AM signal. Um, but in transponders, we've got a swath of frequencies. As we mentioned earlier, the, the device simply listens to a swath of frequencies, amplifies that swath, and then retransmits it on a, on a different frequency. Digital, it's a little bit like FM. And some of them do offer a variety of digital modes as well as multiple channels. Now, users, how can a user affect what's going on on the satellite? Well, on FM, and I think that you'll notice this, and we all learn this from working with repeaters and things too, the loudest signal is going to win. Um, the, it, the, the FM detector, there's a sort of a capture effect, the loudest signal will come through and then the other will be, will be dropped away. On digital, the same kind of thing can occur. You can, if you put too much signal out, you can actually distort your digital signals, so you end up with less throughput overall. On transponders, you're going to try to use CW or sideband, and you gotta remember that the satellite is listening to the whole SWAN, amplifying it, and retransmitting it. So that means that a very loud signal somewhere in the swath of frequencies 
is going to be um, sucking a great deal of the power from this satellite. So if you happen to be using, talking with someone on a different portion of the slap of frequency, and some very strong signal shows up somewhere else that you don't hear, the whole satellite output power is going to, it's going to end up low for you. Um, it's going to try to faithfully reproduce the high signal from the other person, and it's going to have a power budget of sorts. So that means that a loud signal somewhere else is going to cause a variable signal strength as you're listening. So as another person will talk, randomly they will be um, just in talking with variable output from their sideband signal or whatever, and um, they will be, and that will be changing the strength of the signal that you're hearing. So all of these things add up. Now, so what does that mean? That means that satellite operation is going to act a great deal like listening to very, very small signals. It's going to act, it's going to be like uh, doing QRP. Um, and so listening becomes the critical thing. Now, let's play around with what, let's take a look at all of those orbits. Let me, goodness, I got so many things on screens here. I am opening a satellite control program, and I hope you all can see this in a minute. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, thank you, Tom, I saw that. So let's, this is a satellite program. There are many of them available. I like this one because it can control rotators as well as control your radio. That's its biggest advantage. Now, let's pick a satellite from the list. You'll, you'll see, right now you can't really see what's going on. So let's look at it this way. Let's look at the thing as if it's the world. And let's do a little bit of a preview of time here. So here are satellites in orbit. Now, if you look carefully, the spot in the middle here, this is us, this is California right there. And these updates are going on once a minute. You can see these orbits flying around over, overhead. All of these satellites are amateur satellites that we can work. You'll see sometimes there's nothing overhead and then sometimes there's multiples overhead. So let's get out of that mode and let's pick one. Uh, I'll pick Uh, let's try that one. And let's go to just looking at one. All right, let's go to that tracking again. Now this is because I want to I want to mention something here. So this is a FM flying repeater. This is a SO50 coming around the world here. Doing the East Coast right now, getting closer to us as it goes. And you can see what's called its footprint. You can see the blue area is what it can see. So bingo, here it's useful. Came over us. Now, right there, the instant it arrived, we could work Mexico. As it continues, we can work New York, Canada. And how far can we get? Up, oh, can't quite get Greenland. Almost got Greenland, but not quite. Now, you'll notice that this satellite came out of the south. And on its next pass, it's going to also come out of the south. So remember my picture of the satellite orbit uh, with the gain of the antenna of the satellite pointing at the best spot on the Earth? Well, let's imagine that when this came from the south, it was actually in the best spot. But after a number of orbits, which is going to be about six hours later, it's no longer coming at us with the antenna pointing the right way. It's now the opposite. It's going to be coming at us um, with its antenna pointing the wrong direction at us. So here now, this particular orbit coming from the north side 
coming over and it, here it is in Alaska and then, hey, right there, we could work Alaska, but maybe not because the antenna might actually be worst case in this particular mode. It may actually have been better if it was coming from the south. So all of these things add up to make it so that the actual satellite operation is, uh, is complex. So I'm going to go back to multiples and I'm going to go back to the earth picture. Now, we are working this satellite here. This is the, this is the FM satellite that we're flying along here. And you'll notice up here, these are the downlink frequency and the uplink frequency. Can you see my mouse? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Got it, okay. So you'll notice that they're changing in frequency. This is, this is the Doppler that I'm talking about. The satellite program is predicting what the Doppler shift would be. And it's going to be a different amount for the higher frequency for 440 um, than it is for two meters. But you can see that they're both changing. Now, this program can take those frequencies and run them into your radio. So it can control the radio so that you don't have to deal with that. I'm sorry. You don't have to, um, you don't have to actually be sitting there trying to do that. You can let the radio be controlled by this program and therefore you don't have any Doppler problem. Software to the rescue. Now, it also has the ability to steer, since it knows where the satellite is, it has the ability to steer a rotator system and be able to point your antennas at a satellite. Okay, let's set that aside for a while and go back to the presentation. So, let's say you want to make a satellite station. Well, how about you do the simple stuff first? Let's say you just want to do an FM satellite. Uh, so what you want to be able to do then is you want to be able to see if you can hear one of these satellites flying by. Some of them downlink on two meters, only a few of them. Most of them downlink on 440. So if you have a 440 radio, and I'm talking just a handheld, and you listen on the right frequency and you try to just uh, say scan just a little bit up and a little bit down, you may hear a signal. So, what's the first thing you could do to improve such a system? Well, try to improve your antenna. Listen with good headphones um, and see what you get. And probably you should stop a little bit now and again and go over to your computer and open up a software program and kind of follow what's going on. You're going to need this because this is going to tell you when the satellite is up and kind of what direction it may be. And so get yourself some software. Now, how bad is that? That program that I was just talking about, which does absolutely everything you'll ever need it to do, costs a total of $50. And if you're an AMSAT member, it's less expensive than that. <laughs> and there are others that are free. So, so that is the huge out amount of dollars that you have to spend to be able to basically get full understanding of everything that's going on. Okay, antenna gain. How much gain do you need? Well, the best you can get. <laughs> and that's because we're listening for a very small signal. Let me put it this way. Um, these satellites are flying by in a high orbit, they may be 700 miles up when they're directly overhead. In a low orbit, they're more like 400 miles up. But you see, that's when it's directly overhead. That's not really what's going on. When it's over at the horizon and coming at you, it could easily be twice that distance or, or more, and then it goes away from you. you know? So we're talking, communicating with a less than five watt device possibly a thousand miles away. So imagine 
but you're trying to hear some guy, you would be really pleased if you had like a mobile radio in your car with a good antenna on your car and you heard, you were able to hear Simplex directly, somebody talking on an HT in say San Francisco, 65 miles away, you would be really pleased with such a contact. Well, instead, what we're gonna do with these satellites is pretty equivalent. That satellite is a few watts of power, it's line of sight, and it's possibly a thousand miles away. So with a mobile rig, <laughs> or with a, with a small amount of gain in an antenna, surprisingly, you will hear these satellites. You'll hear them when they're 400 miles up because that's the way space is. The signal goes freely in space quite well. And so, so it's very likely that you can actually go out there and spend some time receiving and see what you hear. Now, gain, of course, is a better thing to have. And how do you make gain? Well, you have to have a pointable antenna. You're going to point an antenna in a certain direction with its gain. So with the gain, comes the requirement of being able to point the antenna correctly. Now, it's also fun to work with all mode. And of course, everybody, all of us probably always have, for, for two meters and 440, we probably have FM radios. And very few of us would have an all mode radio for two meters and 440. Uh, so that actually becomes the bottleneck. So can you do this handheld? Yes. These are folks doing it handheld here, but you'll notice that they're not just holding an HT. Um, here, you kind of see this person's got basically the equivalent of a mobile radio. Little pack here, same sort of thing. They're not necessarily holding a huge antenna. Um, that probably has got uh, 3 dB gain on two meters, and uh, all of them roughly around 3 dB gain on two meters, and then greater gain on 440. And they're pointing it by hand. So with such gain on such an antenna, that gain of that antenna is not what you think. It's not like you're pointing a laser. That type of gain, if you're simply in the right quadrant of the sky, you're good enough. So you could almost hunt the sky with that a little bit. Basically, you try to the left. If you don't hear anything, you try to the right. And, and that's kind of all you have to do. You, you, could, you don't really have to track that satellite that closely because the gain of those antennas is actually not that high. So let's pick one like these here. Now this is my set of rigs and you've seen these. A lot of you may have seen these at, at our field days and I hope you come back and see some more. Uh, this was what I was using a few years ago. This is what I'm using now. <laughs> the bottom line is that I just keep wanting more gain. The more gain I can get, the better off. But I'll tell you, more than once during field day, I have had stupid failures, myself making mistakes or whatever, had my rotators quit and things like that. And I have still worked the satellites when the satellite is off, when I'm not pointing at them at all, when I'm pointing at them 45 degrees out of position. So you see, you don't really need high quality, really accurate rotator capability to be able to make this work. If you have a gain antenna like this and you set it up at an angle of maybe 20 degrees off the horizon, and then you just rotated it in a circle, that's probably good enough. You don't really need to actually point any closer than that because gain starts to trump <laughs> direction capability. The key is you get a lot of gain. It get, get a lot of gain and then you're in business. So to kind of get to this conclusion of putting together our station, how can we get to that radio uh, that does everything? Now, the satellites we're talking about are two meters and 440. There's, there's a few satellites that do telemetry on 1.2 gigahertz. Um, there's one that does communication on 1.2 gigahertz, um, although actually I think it's no longer doing that. Uh, 
So you're looking for two meter and 440 radios, but let's be careful. 440 means the portion of the 440 band that is low, the 435 range. That's the frequency range that you need for 440. Two meters, the satellites are right in the middle of the band, right at 146, right there. So for an all mode capability, well, there's an actually very simple way to receive all mode for two meters and 440. And I think a lot of you may already be aware of that. Uh, there's a dongle, capability, just a USB dongle you can get, um, came out of, um, came out of the use of a uh, uh, satellite, satellite um, television capability from Europe. And anyway, those dongles are available for as low as $12. And with one of those and the proper software, you can actually create an all mode um, uh, uh, software defined radio receiver for every band, the entire thing. So. That's so for receive, you can do that kind of thing. FM is the most common radios we all have for all mode. Well, <laughs> that's the real key. How can we come up with all mode radios for two meters and 440? Well, here, here's the dongle. Here's the dongle for the receive side. So we can get receive 100%. And we back up one and go off for a minute and do a little web surfing. So here's a real strange thing that some of you might be aware of. I searched for <laughs> I searched for two meters in all mode and came up with this. Surprise, surprise. Um, this radio is made by a group that builds radios for CB for the CB group, but they offer a radio that handles 10 meters. So uh, this is a 10 meter all mode radio. That is $250. Then there's this company called the uh, Transponder. What's the name of the company here? Transverter Store. <laughs> you can buy a kit that does two meter, does two meter to ten meter transversion for sixty dollars, or you can buy it assembled for a hundred dollars. So you see, you can create an all mode two meter transmit capability for 350 bucks and, and $12 for a dongle for receive and start playing around the software. So there are ways to get into the world of satellites. Uh, and it, the real key is to try to find the radio to be able to do the work. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the other side of it, doing things like the antennas are is, is the fun part. Um, you can make your own antennas. You can sneak up on rotation. You don't have to do too much of it. Uh, you don't have to have a real serious rotation to be able to be effective. And it comes down to all the time that what you're doing is uh, QRP radio capability. You're trying to listen to a very small signal. So everything you can to be able to hear those small signals, the better off you are. The easiest device to communicate with is the International Space Station. 250 miles up, it's enormous, so it has a nice ground plane. It is actually stabilized in such a way that it points for the Earth all the time because they always continue to refuel it. So it has got gain antennas that point at the Earth and it's as strong as a, uh, it, it's as strong as a local repeater. Um, and so once again, how can you talk with somebody on the space station? Well, <laughs> imagine a repeater that has got the coverage of half of the United States. You'll notice that it's going to be busy all the time, mm. but it's up there. And there's actually an onboard the station, there's, there is an FM repeater. So, um, so just like the other satellites, um, there's a onboard FM repeater system that, that flies on the International Space Station as well. Okay, in conclusion, Satellite operation is very active. Um, it's, there's international work going on all over the world. There is people building these things. They're small things. They're getting, how, how, how much can you get away with with a small amount of things? That's, uh, that seems to be the world of satellites now. Uh, there are a few 
people trying to put together something major, like a large system, to be able to run up to 1,300 miles, that would put it into the Van Allen belts, which is a radiation belt portion that is uh, ignored by most other satellite people because it, it can fail the electronics. But there are, but since it's kind of an open space, uh, there are people trying to build amateur satellites to put in that area. Um, international efforts take on, universities are involved, people are learning a great deal about how satellite motion takes place, how like satellite antenna things are responsible. And putting together a station could be as simple as a handheld antenna with good headphones. But very likely after a few trials, that what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go for it. You're going to want to try to put together antennas and a rotation scheme and find yourself an all mode radio or come up with a plan to be able to put one of those together too. Uh, so that is the world of satellites. And now what I want to do is take everybody's questions if there's anybody still awake. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, Richard, I'm going to turn it over to you and John to handle the questions. I have a few, but I'll let the rest of the group go first. Thank you, John. Okay, I guess I should go back to um, go back to video mode and goodness, now that I'm, I'm sharing screen, how do I quit sharing screen? Uh, there's a button up at the top, uh, stop sharing. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now you, now you could always make me the presenter again here. Have to do something? What you do I have to give away? Uh, Would the chat, or not chat, but uh, participants? Participants. And you would see Richard and Moore, and uh, somewhere in there is make uh, make presenter. Or make make host. While you're doing that, when I first got my license and my first HT in FT60, I programmed it and I was reading about the satellites. So I programmed in uh, the Doppler range in the radio. As I'm away home from up Highway 17, I was going around Big Moody Curve and my radio was sitting on the seat on scam and it locked onto a signal. I looked down, it was the International Space Station on a rubber duck inside the car and I had it for about 200 yards before I went around another mountain and it lost it but it's wow. it's possible at low power oh so Gary is that why I I see you I see you coming up for field day for the satellite station all the time is that what set off the, uh, <laughs> the I had the bug satellite? before when you when I saw you up at field day, I, that cinched it because I already had the bug. I was already interested. <laughs> and then working the, the space station was the icing on the cake. That's yeah, uh, did, did you hear the, were they talking? Was that the actual way astronauts talking? They were, talk, they were talking with a classroom, I believe. Oh, good. congratulations. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, John, what's the protocol? Who do you call when you uh, talk to a uh, space station or just on a satellite repeater? Okay, so um, if you were doing an FM, what I find on the FM satellites is that um, a great deal of people are simply, first of all, first of all, this is full duplex. Uh, it's two separate frequencies. So this is full duplex capability. If you are talking, you should be able to hear your own voice. So the very first thing that people are trying to do, and almost all the time they're trying to do this on the FM satellites, is they're trying to hear themselves. So what people do is they put on a call sign and a grid square as fast as they can. And 
a lot of the time, <laughs> nobody replies to it. The next thing that happens is the person, the next person puts out their call sign in grid square. And, and everyone is just trying to hear themselves, you know, then that, that tends to be the protocol on FM satellites at first. And then after a while, when there's a little bit of a break in time, someone may answer to your call. You know, if, you, if I've said uh, uh, KJ6NL, Charlie Mike 87 somebody might come back and say KJ6NL and then reply, you know, and uh, you might get anything from uh, California, from Los Angeles to Santa Clara Valley to Utah, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get, um, but it is packed and there's people doing that all the time. And that's the extent of the exchange. There's one or two people that are on the radio all the time and they will rank you. Meaning that they'll say, hey, Gary, good to hear you again. <laughs> and that's the end of the rag tube, you know. <laughs> now, it, on a transponder satellite, it's a little different. Um, it, if it's not something like field day, then on the transponder satellite, what you'll hear is you'll hear people talking. And they will be rag chewing. And the satellite will go out of the sky. But they're all using software programs and the next one is coming over and they immediately swap to the next one. And I hear people in a conversation on one and the satellite goes out of the sky and the next satellite comes over and they just pick up right where they left off on the next satellite. Wow. Are there, um, are there like satellite contests I know there's there's contesting for all sorts of things. Is, is there one for satellite? You know, I am complete. I am unaware of any satellite specific contest. Uh, contest. Um, I use uh, on field day. What we do on field day is, and by the way, this is this is a recent event with respect to satellites. AMSAT chose to start tracking how many people made satellite contacts on field day. And it was something they began doing about 10 years ago. Um, it was like a new thought. They said, hey, you know what? Field day is going on and all these people are doing satellites. Why don't we um, track how many of them made contacts and what satellites they use? So a person at AMSAT um, put together an, a, pro, a plan and said, um, give us your results. And so every year that I've been, that I've been aware of that, uh, we've been doing that at our field day and putting in our, um, putting in our results. Um, we've done pretty good. Um, we've managed to be in the top three a number of times. We managed to do second place, things like that in the whole country. So that felt good. Um, but that is, that is AMSAT sort of uh, capitalizing on the fact that um, field day is there. And uh, people put together satellite stations on field day because you get 100 points for field day if you make just one contact. So that means there's a lot of people on the air. Um, if it's not field day, then you can have hours go by and the satellites will be up and nobody's using them. That's not true on the FM satellites. The FM satellites, people keep trying, but on the, uh, the all mode ones uh, during the week and things like this, you, you, they're free. You know, there's nobody, uh, nobody using the band. You said that um, you would not, you would not be allowed to do something. Uh, uh, launch into a mode or something like that. Who is it? Is there sort of a governing body that oversees that, like equivalent to the FCC for amateur radio? Is there, who, who kind of regulates all this and, and watches over the 25 year rule? Um, the NOAA was one of the pages we were reading. I can go back to the internet and um, share screen again and show you some others, which is basically the FCC is also um, trying to take responsibility for satellites. You're kind of breaking um, up a little, John. Yeah, John, your audio is really bad because you're not using earphones. The echo cancellation is cutting out your voice. I'm going to drop my audio my video again. 
and then so um, the if we go back to that part of the conversation about international law, uh, actually it has been um, uh, uh, United Nations has actually created your audio is really not yeah good, you're not John. you're not close enough to the microphone so it's cutting off all the time. This is strange. Uh, how about now? That's much better. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so the United Nations have actually created a series of um, plans for satellite operation. And they have, like, the first ones were done years ago, and they keep updating them. And um, it's kind of unclear if all. Uh, companies that are putting satellites up are actually even following the rules. Mm -hmm. And um, the 25 year rule thing hasn't been, as far as I can tell by internet surfing, it has never really been tested. Like uh, someone, uh, their satellite was up and, and, and they got their hand slapped by the United Nations because they did something wrong. I, I, I'm unaware of anything like that. Uh, there was a near miss just a couple of months ago, um, but it was a miss. And so I'm sure people are wagging their fingers at each other about that, but I don't believe anyone has actually been called on the carpet and have to actually, uh, you know, uh, like, like violated an actual rule. There's also plans going on. Um, there's Japan apparently has started a plan. This is not just Japan alone. They, they're working with the United Nations to start a plan for satellite for cleanup, for space cleanup. Yeah. I don't actually know how that technology is supposed to work, um, but at least people are, are thinking in that direction. John, in terms of the all mode radios, I have an older FT847, and they're still prized because they can do satellite communication but their uh, the computer control of the radio is rather primitive and you said that uh, 1.2 gigahertz is really not much going on there and it looks like the future is going to be 5 and 10 gigahertz but I don't see anything uh, any practical system that you can buy now to get on those bands um, I would say the future for the next five years, it's two meters and four quarters. I think you can still play the game and have fun with that for a while. And the reason for that is because universities and uh, smaller groups and things like this are taking uh, existing designs because they're proven and they would get through the um, all of the requirements and tests and procedures that are required for your satellite to be approved to be used as ballast for a flight. So satellites are going to go up for the next five or six years based on uh, technologies that were probably built 10 years ago. And that will still be the game for a while. Um, then as far as the upper bands go, I know that there's, you know, there's a lot of FCC fighting going on for who gets what bands now for 5G and everything else. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, if we're going to be able to keep amateur bands, uh, but the, um, the the highest level thing that I've seen is downlinking on 2.4. Um, 440 up and 2.4 down is some of the telemetry is doing that. 1.2 gig seems to be kind of falling by the wayside. Okay, good. And the um, geosynchronous one, like I mentioned, it's it's a 2.4 and a 10 gig, um, and it's in geosynchronous orbit. That's 226,000 miles up. Um, I have to say this: when I was doing a long time ago, when I was doing AO13, and it was in its uh, Molnia orbit, it would get so that it was um, 12,000 miles out. I think it was even more than that. Um, and I was still working people with 75 watts transmitted on two meters. And 
listening on 440. And most of the time for field day, when I'm doing all of my contacting, everything on field day, I'm using 12 watts or so, less than 15 watts. You know, so, um, so as far as the radio transmit capability, 15 watts is good with the antennas that you see that I play with. Um, and um, receive capability, like I said, is almost free, you know, today. But, of course, you have to play with some software to get that to work. There's advantages to that, of course, because that software also offers, uh, you know, waterfall displays and everything, you know. Um, you mentioned um, there are a lot so, of universities sending up CubeSats. I know UCSC has sent up. I believe UCSC has sent up one. Do you know anything about that, the status of it? And I don't know. And in fact, other people on the air, on the, on the air, <laughs> other people uh -huh. tonight could probably answer that question better. I think they have an operational ground station that I've seen, and they have a multi-year project to work on a satellite, but they have not put up a satellite yet. Uh, okay. And it's been rather crippled by the fact that they don't have people on site anymore. All the instruction at UCSC is being done remotely now. Yeah. And they had an extremely active club, but uh, it's become a problem because they're doing all by remote uh, attendance. So Steve told me that the club is kind of falling apart. The, the president has moved away to San Diego, so... Uh, they're having trouble filling the officers, but they do have a complete ground station set up. And yeah, and I the, believe that they did have a plan. They, they did design a satellite and they were, they did not actually get confirmation of a launch. Right, so each year the students try to contribute to an ongoing CubeSat project. But in the meantime, they have the, the ground station but it's been a real problem that uh, they're no longer conducting classes in person. Uh, yeah. I was talking about satellites up from other places like the Philippines. Uh, that was actually from university in Philippines and that's a fun satellite to work. It actually, we worked it on field day. It was, works quite well. Um, China, of course, like I said, is actually responsible for almost 75% um, of the amateur satellites that are up right now. And university students from China have actually made uh, satellites that are orbiting the moon. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for John? Well, I want to say one other thing. Um, if anyone wants to play the game a little bit, um, 440 gain antennas, like you saw those people holding handheld, I have four of them. Um, anybody, would you want to borrow one? Hook it to your HT and see what you can hear. Um, uh, I've got them available. And quite honestly, I have an entire set <laughs> of, of gain antennas for two meter and uh, 440 um, cross yaggies that that are free for the taking, and a set of rotators. Uh, they're not um, electronically controllable rotators, but I've got a set of rotators. If anyone wants to jump in uh, and see what this is all about, I'd love to be able to help you. And I've got a lot of equipment to go with it. The only thing I don't have is a giveaway uh, all mode radio. Wow, that's very nice. How do we get a hold of you? Uh, email. <laughs> used, used to be able to say you just talk to me on the repeater, but it seems like nobody does that. Right? <laughs> and you want to just give out last, your email? Just last week, the space station was transmitting SSTV on two meters. So it was relatively easy to try and capture uh, SSTV pictures from the space station. So if you're just getting started in it, that's some something uh, certainly you can try and do to catch packet radio from the space station or a couple times a year they do slow scan TV. That's right. And in fact, the 
amateur radio station on board the space station has just recently been upgraded. Um, I don't know the full story on that. Uh, like I said, internet search will find out. Um, but uh, equipment that has been on that station for 20 years or whatever has been recently replaced. And I, and I believe that it's kind of being checked out. Uh, and, and a lot of people are, are finding it's working just great. Wow, that's nice. You want to give us your email, John, so people can contact you if they want to work with you more or, or take you up on your generous offer of equipment loan? Oh, I'm on Cruise.io. So I'm, I'm Jay Sisler at Cruise.io.com. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I've seen your station at Field Day um, evolve over the years, and it's really been great to see your passion um, to to put that forward. And you're always so generous uh, sharing your time and your expertise with people who are interested at Field Day. So thank you. The other piece that I've noticed over the years is that there are a lot more opportunities to contact satellites during field day. So there's a lot more up there, as you've said. So it's a, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much for all you do for field day. And thank you for coming in this evening, taking the evening off work to give us this really nice presentation. Well, believe me, I, I, I wanted to take the day off of work. <laughs> <laughs> This was a good uh, excuse to take a day off of work. Yes, I really enjoy, I, I enjoy satellites, uh, and I enjoy satellite for field day. Um, if it was not field day, quite honestly, um, I probably would not do very much satellite work. And the reason is because there's just not that, not that many people on there. Um, and, uh, and field day, of course, is busy, 100% busy for the entire time, and it's a lot of fun. And I like to hear how far away I can make contact. Um, and, uh, and, and also, other stations that are out there playing the field day thing have got multiple operators and they have spotter system things going on, they have other people listening and all sorts of things to help things out. And uh, I keep trying to get that to happen at field day. I keep trying to get more people to be able to help with the listening. Because quite honestly, I think that there, there are some folks out there that can hear off-frequency sideband signals and things like that better than I can and, and pull a call sign out of that uh, strange sounding audio faster than I can. So I really, I really hope that I can get more people to be able to uh, come out to field day, put on a set of headphones and tell me what they hear. Mm -hmm. Nice. And hopefully next year's field day will not have to be so sequestered as what we had to do this year. But um, I'm very grateful for you to that you went ahead and you put up your station and, and some people did come up on the appointment basis. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to a more expanded field day next year. Are there any other questions for John? Any comments? Anything else? Okay, I don't hear anything. Um, Richard, do you see anybody with a hand raised or anything like that that wants to say something? Uh, anybody want to raise their hand? I don't see anybody. No? Okay. Well, John, thank you once again for this great presentation. And um, David is recording it, so it will be put up on uh, the k6bj.org website for others to watch and for us to come back and see it again. And um, again, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank, like, thanks, John. Thank you, Tom. Um, appreciate it. And I'm really sorry that the audio cut in and out. Oh, no, that a, it's fine. Did you just give me a Vulcan? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wave to Becky. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask if there's anything else uh, for the meeting before we close it. Just, uh, let me know or let Richard know by waving your hand. I can't see you, but Richard can. 
<laughs> okay, Richard, do you see any anybody that has something else they want to add or anybody that has joined our meeting um, that we didn't acknowledge early on? I just want to know what Karen is eating. <laughs> My husband made me some chocolate chip cookies. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Nice. <laughs> we'll be right over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if there's nothing more, then I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us. And, John, thank you again. And um, we'll, we'll be listening on the air for us. Uh, for Sadie with the Scout Jamboree. And um, thank you all very much for joining the meeting tonight. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks for setting up the Zoom. And David, thank you for recording. Hey, Richard. I yes. Think you're, I think your, uh, your picture, your satellite picture thing from Field Day ended up on the AMSAT webpage. I, I noticed it. It's on the cover of the magazine there. <laughs> yeah, that's a great oh. photo. So I talked about satellites internationally all over the place, but I guess it's kind of a small world, isn't it? <laughs> that's such a great photo. I'm glad. I'm glad it's been spread far and wide. Well, I had some really? really, really good photos from years ago. Um, I don't know if I see if I can find them here. Uh, I think it was the first field day that I worked. Uh, I got uh, some very good ones of uh, John with the sun behind him. Uh -huh. I don't know what I have in here. Oh, there's well, there's a picture of these mystery boxes that I found, and they turned out to be Gary's. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, my, I, would my, I would invite anybody that has interesting photographs to, um, you can send them to me or you can send them to Ron Baldwin, K6EXT, but um, I can't remember his email right now. But if you have anything interesting, do send it and we'll put it up on the, the website in, in our short skip. Yeah. I have photos. Let's see, uh, this was 2019, 18. So I think this is my third, third year. Eh. So I'm very, I'm actually very interested in this, uh, this, this scouting thing here. So I, I wanna see if we can catch some scouts on the air here. Uh, uh -huh. Cause I, I don't do an awful lot of uh, phone, phone work uh, from home because uh, I have fairly limited, limited range. I, I, I have managed to hit St. Louis uh, before, but that was on a good day. Well, thanks, John. This was great. Thank you. Oh, I really appreciate all the comments. I, uh, I know I just started kind of rambling, but I appreciate that everybody seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. Thank you. Yeah. And interesting you. stuff. There's more things to spend money on hot diggity dog. <laughs> buy myself an antenna and a, and a, and a, and a transceiver and, a, and, and I have no idea. You know, how, how in the world, actually, here's a darn good question for you. Uh, field day, I presume you're, you're hand entering this stuff. Uh, I can't remember because I, I did work your station the first year. I went to uh, I went to field day, um, and you were logging this stuff in K1MM, and uh, because uh, uh, Rich, uh, what is it, uh, K K1B or K1EB or what, whatever his call sign is, would clobber anybody who gave it to him handwritten ever again. Um, I got away with that once. That was that was the the uh, six six meter thing, but. Uh, when, when you're when you're out uh, when you're out operating uh, on satellite, uh, how do you uh, how to keep your log? So you didn't just. When I'm operating on satellite, I'm in a hurry. Uh, I'm going as fast as I can. Oh, you got and really really garbled sound again. What's the matter? 
Uh, better I'll copy. No, there you go. I'll copy. Okay. Um, so, KE1B, uh, Rich, um, you want everything in, in N1MM. Um, and I noticed in N1MM that the way people get started in their contact is uh, you, you put in the call sign you heard. And then you find out whether or not it's a dupe, and then you make your contact. And satellite operation is full of flex. And so if you're doing something like on satellite, and you're doing, uh, you know, kilo six, mic, 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 CQ, CQ, kilo six, mic, and you hear a piece of someone while you're talking, and that's a person trying to get your attention. You know, this is full duplex. So they jump back in on you really quickly. And, um, so we're all in a hurry there. So you get a half of a person's call sign, and you might get his um, number of stations and location. And then he may repeat it. You, you'll, you'll hear a piece of it again in the satellite. And then the audio, and it got a bit of like, you know, sometimes that's the way the audio acts. And uh, so trying to work with them while making the contact just wasn't working out. So instead, I'm basically just writing down what I'm hearing on a piece of paper, any piece of it, any piece of it that I hear, and, and then filling it out until I get the whole transmission, and then I put a circle around that and try to make the next one. And when it's all over, when the satellite pass is gone and there's nothing in the sky, then we take that piece of paper and we start loading it into one in there. <laughs> so that's how that's how I play field day, um, and. I don't really think that there's a way to get around that. Um, spent a lot of time this year with Carrie trying to discover if there was a program that was correct for satellite contacts. And we never really came up with one. Uh, in what in itself is not set up for satellite contacts. It doesn't have all of the satellites listed or anything like that. And there really isn't any sort of contest in satellite software because I don't believe there really is any satellite Contest. Okay, well, unfortunately, your, your sound was really, really garbled there, and I got about half of that. Wow. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, need, need, to, need, need, to, need to find uh, your, your headset uh, and, and plug it into the computer, I guess. Okay, how about this? Is this better or worse? That's tremendously better. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So I think I finally discovered my whole issue. Everyone, I really am sorry about this, but it's, it's that I believe I was on a different microphone the whole time. Oh, that would. My, my computer, my computer system, isn't this classic? I was going to give a presentation. So two days ago, my home computer system failed with a virus. Uh -huh. And so everything had to be a temporary setup here. So I ran the whole thing off of a laptop on top of another thing um, and um, using a different display. And so uh, the camera system was off of a camera that's not part of the laptop. And previously what normally happens is the audio is coming into that camera, but instead it's been using the audio on the laptop the whole time. And the laptop has always been off to my left about three feet away. Oh, uh, yes. But when you, when you click on the little up arrow next to your, uh, the, the microphone icon at the bottom of the screen there, uh, it will show you which microphone you're actually using. Um, I have two of them uh, on my on my desktop right now. That's what I'm uh, operating off of. Yeah, but it is it is showing me that I'm using the webcam microphone. Uh, there is a, uh, a mi another microphone directly plugged into the back of the computer that uh, I usually use for meetings and so on, uh, where I don't want to use the webcam. And hey, uh, Richard, how copy now? Yeah, that's that's fine. Oh, that's great. I wish you had told me that earlier because I now I believe I'm talking to the camera. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like it's working better. Well, I'm talking directly at the camera right now and I swapped over. I wish I had. I am really sorry. Okay, well, there's no point in having recorded this. <laughs> oh, no, you were able to. We could hear you. It was going in and out sometimes, but we let you know. Well, we're it improved. 
we're ham radio yeah. operators. We're accustomed to this stuff. There we go. The only thing that we really didn't have was somebody trying to, you know, uh, make a contact over top of you. <laughs> <laughs> they do that during field day all the time, don't they? And it's like, was that me completing that uh, QSO to Wisconsin or was that somebody else? <laughs> Oh, well, I, I hope you at least got the gist of what I was trying to say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Very it was very good. Yeah. I